Thank you all for coming. Chairman of the board, Alex Gorin. <laughs> Chairman of the board, Alex Gorin. University President, Professor Rivka Karmi. Rector, Professor Tsia Cohen. Susan Glotowski, Adelaine Glotowski, uh, dear guests. Good morning. Welcome all to the annual uh, event, Zlotowski event. It's a pleasure to continue this tradition and the commitment of Bangui University for Excellency in Neuroscience and Brain Research. My name is, my name is uh, Professor Alon Friedman. I'm a member of the Department of Physiology and Cell Biology and the new Department for Brain and Cognitive Sciences. And I'm the director of the Zlotowski Center for Neuroscience here at Bangui University of the Negev. We have a particular special event planned for this morning. We will begin with uh, the presentation of the Dotovsky Admission Awards for Outstanding Students, uh, followed by a lecture titled Welcome to the World of Personalized Medicine that will be presented by uh, Patrick Absicher, President of Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Luzanne. I hope the <laughs> accent was more or less. I would like to begin by addressing the recipients of this year's Lutovsky Admission Award for Outstanding Students. This award is given only to the very best new students at Ben-Gurion University based on an average of their matriculation exam scores and their psychometric exam scores. This year, the award was granted to a total of 154 students. Zlotowski students consistently prove that the award is well-deserved. They have maintained highest grades at the departmental and faculty levels, and they often receive additional prizes for outstanding achievements during the studies. The percentage of Zlotowski students who pursue graduate degrees at PGUs is significantly higher than that of the other students. It is my pleasure to ask the students representing, uh, representing this year's Zlotowski Admission Awards recipients to stand up and be recognized. Please stand up. Thank you very much. I would now like to ask Mayan Palti Negev, a representative of our Zlotowski Award recipients, to join me on stage and say a few words. Dear Mrs. Zlotowski, my name is Mayan Palti Negev. I am a first year student at the departments of politics, politics and government and State of Israel Studies. The name Negev is because my grandfather was an archaeologist who helped establish Kibbutz Revivim here in the Negev, and he changed our family name to Negev. I am a recipient of the Zlotowski Admission Award for Outstanding Students, and I am honored to address you on behalf of the 154 students who received this award this year. I am 25 years old and grew up in Karmel Yosef, a community settlement halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. In high school, I was active in the Maccabi Tsair youth group as a scouting instructor. Following high school, I did a year of volunteering here in the Negev in the educational community of Nitsana. I worked as a hiking counselor with high school students and managed a nature preservation project here in the area. To me, it seemed like a natural continuation to high school, giving back to youth and combining my two passions, working with teens and being in nature. This special year helped me mature and become a better soldier and later a better officer. I then joined the IDF and worked in the IDF spokesperson unit for four years, for two of them in the regular army and for two in the, as an officer. During this time, I had to deal with many dilemmas of how to best represent the IDF in complex political situations, and my service was very challenging and exciting. After traveling a while in Africa, I debated where to pursue my studies and was considering to study at the Hebrew University. But when I found out that I would receive the Zlotowski Prize, I was just thrilled. This prize helped me make up my mind to study here at Ben Gurion. The support I receive, I receive gives me peace of mind so I can focus all my energy on my studies. My studies at the Department of Politics and Government are really interesting. I chose to study State of Israel Studies as a second major, and this fascinating combination 
enables me to investigate Israel society, international politics, and the philosophy of politics that were all new to me. I love studying here at Ben-Gurion. There's so much happening on campus, so many cultural, social, and political organizations to join, so many ways to be involved, you just have to reach out and do it. During my studies, I work as an environmental studies counselor at an elementary school in Be'er Sheva. I teach the children to regard nature as a limited source and try to emphasize to them how important it is to be responsible about our consumption if we want to keep living on this planet for generations to come. After graduating from here, I hope to pursue a career in social organizations or local politics and for sure take an active role in Israel's future. I know that Ben Gurion is the right place for me to start. Dear Susie, I know that because of you, so many talented students can choose to study here. On behalf of all of the Zlatovsky Award recipients, thank you for believing in us and in what we can become. Thank you for letting us realize our abilities and leave our mark on the Negev and the State of Israel. Toda Raba. Thank you, Mayan. I would like now to ask University President Professor Rivka Karmi to approach the podium and be joined by uh, Michel Halperi, President of our Swiss Associates, who will introduce our guest of honor and today's lecture, Professor Patrick Epsichel. Okay, it is uh, totally unplanned, but it is a huge, huge honor and pleasure to introduce you, Michel. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, intro I'm introducing the introductor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Michel Halperin, and uh, forget, forgive me for saying Halperin in Hebrew and not Halperan in, 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 in front, okay? I understand. <laughs> so, uh, Michael Halperin. <laughs> Uh, is the uh, president of um, Ben Gurion Associates in Switzerland for the past 25 years. We are now this year celebrating 25 years, and actually, uh, you are Michelle, uh, the most. You are the veterans among veterans. You are the uh, the the uh, president that have been served for. I think now. Uh, more than any other one. So I'm not going to tell this very uh, this, uh, distinguished audience about your achievements over there in Switzerland, uh, your professional, your political, uh, your involvement in the Jewish community, uh, all that you're doing throughout the years to promote Ben Gurion University. Uh, I'm not go even going to tell about your family, your lovely family, uh, and Esther, your wife, who is, uh, where is Esther? Yeah, just in front of me. Just in front of me. Hello, Esther. We just, uh, I acknowledge the uh, Karen Avraham project that, uh, and, and this is a good opportunity for me to, uh, to correct a mistake. I said, you know, Karen celebrating Moshe. its, Karen Moshe. Karen Moshe, celebrating its uh, 10th anniversary. It's already 17 years that they are, the foundation is in effect. So excuse me for that. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. This is not the end of, uh, of our acknowledgments of you and to you and your family. Uh, and now I give you the podium to uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you, Rivka. It's the first time I see an introducer to be introduced. But uh, there is a beginning for everything in life, and uh, maybe there is an end, although uh, these 25 years uh, as chairman of the Swiss Associates have been a honor, a pleasure, but to some extent a kind of uh, uh, forced work forever. So uh, uh, the only thing which is uh, not difficult is to resist any attempt to become chairman in my stead. So if there are volunteers among the very important Swiss delegations we have today, uh, they are pleased, uh, they are invited to uh, be known to me because uh, it's time to change generations. And therefore, 
I'm calling for public offers for followers. And uh, it's not necessarily for 25 years. It can also be for 30 or 35 for those of you who like length situations. Uh, dear Rivka Kami, professor and president of this university, dear president and professor Patrick Ebicher, president of uh, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale in Lausanne, uh, dear Alex Goren, chairman of the board, uh, and dear Suzanne Zlotowski and Zlotowski family, and uh, distinguished guests and uh, professors and students and friends, it's a privilege for me uh, to uh, present you today, Professor Patrick Ebicher. Professor Patrick Ebicher uh, was born and educated in Switzerland, where he became a uh, doctor. He uh, improved uh, his skills in staying quite a long time in American universities, where he studied uh, more specifically uh, biology and um, uh, biomolecular and uh, physiology and neurology and neurobiology and then he taught the, those disciplines at uh, Brown University and finally he decided that he wanted to come back to his uh, mother country where he became of course a teacher in Lausanne University and then at this Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale of Lausanne which is uh, the real top academic, most prestigious institution in our country. And he's presiding this institution for the last 13 years, uh, which is quite an achievement because he has been renewed and renewed and renewed and re-elected by his colleagues because of the incredible work he has been doing. Not only he has been a fantastic researcher with more than uh, uh, several hundred publications, but uh, he has been an incredible conqueror uh, in the development of his uh, school of uh, uh, engineering. And um, this is so much so that in his 12, 13 years of presidency, uh, the number of students have doubled, the number of buildings have doubled, the budget has, has tripled, and uh, these kind of figures do not amaze you. I think you, you may hear in the back of your brains that this is exactly what is happening in other places. Yes, but this happened not in BGU and not in an Israeli university in this speedy country, but in my country, Switzerland, where we know everything is slow, prudent, cautious, difficult to realize under the scrutiny of uh, people who vote on every issue. And there is a miracle in Switzerland. This miracle is named Patrick Ebicher. He succeeds whatever he undertakes. And what is more impressive uh, still is that despite all his successes, he is still undisputed and unanimously praised and respected in Switzerland, which gives an evidence that sometime you can be a prophet in your own country. Uh, he will receive today the doctorate honoris causa of this university, which shows that the BGU enhances uh, those who are in the dynamic of uh, science and research and creativity for whose there is no boundaries. And if you permit me to conclude by borrowing to the magnificent uh, lecture delivered yesterday by Amos Oz, uh, greeting uh, Patrick Ebicher is greeting one dreamer who is changing reality. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michel, for this too kind introduction. Dear President Kame, this is Mrs. Slotsky, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, first, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, and it's also a great honor. Uh, I have great memories about the State of Israel that I dearly like. I even spent some vacation with my family, and I do remember passing through this town 10 years ago. And yesterday when I came, I couldn't recognize the place. I thought we had an institution that grows fast, but you certainly outfast us. I thought today I would give maybe what I call a helicopter view of a subject 
in this case, of medicine. As Michel was saying, I was trained as a medical doctor and then as a neuroscientist, and I had a wonderful life of enjoying doing science, which is what passions me. And about uh, tw 13 years ago, I was asked to take over an engineering school. And that was a very intriguing endeavor, something that I didn't really know. But I thought I would try to take it because I had the, f the feeling that engineering, basic science, and medical science would start to interact and would tr start to change the way medicine would be practiced in the years to come. And that's what I would try to illustrate with, uh, during this little conference. First, let me tell you what I call today's science megatrends. It's a, a bit barbaric name, but I, had, I was obsessed when I took the presidency by what I call info nano bio cogno convergence. What do I mean by that? I mean by the convergence between information sciences, nanosciences, biological sciences, and cognitive science. And this is indeed happening today, and I also feel that this is also something that you are looking at. It has a consequence, which is that it leads to a deluge of data. We are absolutely swamped with data in the 21st century. But the good news is now, because of our friends in computer science, we start to build a capacity to extract meaning of this large data. And you think about the Googles of the world, this is what it is all based on. This capacity that we call in our jargon data mining or machine learning. And this is indeed happening in all areas of society. Big data, I say, is the oil of the 21st century. Big data impacts everything. Healthcare, I'll try to demonstrate this. Leisure, education. Probably some of you have heard about this revolution on going on online education called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Yeah, I was proud to have doubled the number of students from 2000 to 2013, from 4,000 to about 9,000. But since we put our course online, in six months, we have 250,000 students. And we predict that next year we may have a million students. Now, we're living something very different. And we're going to have to adapt ourselves to this new world. Now, would you say, where does the data come? We are, in fact, generating this data. Everyone is a source of big data. Cell phones, web access, credit cards, embedded systems that are becoming more and more important. So what I like about, you know, some people say Google knows probably more about you than your spouse. Welcome to the world of personalization technology. And this is something about fascinating, but on the other side, maybe frightening. What is the effect of this big data on medicine? It's, in fact, at the basis of what we would call the revolution to call the four Ps. Predictive medicine, participative medicine, personalized medicine, and preventive medicine. Let me go through some of those. What are we meaning by predictive medicine? It's the possibility to predict the probability of a disease based on information provided by what we call omics genomics, proteomics, all those barbaric words, but that, in fact, provide data about what we are. And there you could potentially institute measures in order to prevent or significantly decrease the impact of disease. Let me give you, of course, one example. This is probably the most striking. You may know that the Human Genome Project was started in the U.S. at the time with a budget of three billion dollars. It took more than 15 years to have the first human genome, and it costed 15 billion. Now, you can see in 2001, it costed 100 million. And now, today, we're about close to be a thousand dollar for a human genome, and probably in the next two to three years, it'll be about a hundred to two hundred dollars. So, to some extent, it will become a commodity. 
we could imagine that each of us, if we want, may have this genome sequenced. Who would have thought about that? Now, it's even worse. You can go to the Internet. There's an interesting company called 23andMe. That's the wife of one of the two founders of Google that started this company. And it proposed you just, you send for about $200, it's, they send you a little package. 100 now. That's right. <laughs> you see, it's going even faster. <laughs> As you speak. You did. You just have to spit, and then you will receive, you know, they will analyze and provide you with information with time. Now, of course, we still have to read this DNA. We're far from being, you know, uh, uh, close to, to, to understand it. But the idea is that we will keep us informed about the disease that we may be exposed. Some people may want to know, some people less, but certainly it is there at the tip of our finger. So that's one thing. The second thing, which is also a very interesting uh, feature of what is happening in the IT revolution. It's called participative, participative medicine. It, it utilizes the social networks to allow patients suffering from a similar disease to compare their diagnostic, symptoms, side effects, you name it. There is a company, if you go on the web today, called Patients Like Me. You can share, you can deposit your medical records. And its founder said something which I thought was quite intriguing, and specific for lawyers in the room. In a publicly funded healthcare system, it is morally unjust that results from a patient-physician interaction are not reported back to the public. It is like not reporting a witness crime. This is a very different way to look at our own health and a participative effort to try to help the others by sharing who you are. Now, you can say, how would the society react? This is what you would call the web-based biobanks. You can see that from 2008, you could see the massive increase of the people who are ready first to have the DNA sequence and second to share their medical records. This, for me as an MD, is just going to the opposite. We were all raised with what we call le secret médical, the medical secret that we had to. So how are we going to have to deal with this? is going to be very interesting in the years to come. So to some extent, you go with this power of the wet lab. You are getting on one side the genetic information, the medical records. You'll need to, to get the informed consent of educated patients with the idea that you will develop better therapies for potentially you, but certainly for the generations to come. Now, of course, the co concerns are very obvious about first is the overall acceptance by society, but also what I would call the right not to know. Do you really want to know all the disease that you might get, catch in the future? You might be okay if you think that we have a therapy, but if we don't, that might be a disturbing thing. I think we need to protect the access to data, cyber security, and that shows again another interaction between cybersecurity as we think it from the military defense safety, but also for the data that is going to be generated by this kind of approach. And also there's great concern about the possibility of, for companies to access personal data. To some extent, the Googles have them today. And I think we have to think, really, of how we want to react as a society. How far are we ready to share what we are at the most intimate with the rest of the humanity. Now that will lead to something which is fascinating, which is the emergence of what we call personalized medicine. What we mean by that is to adapt prevention, diagnostic, and therapy to the genetic characteristic of each individual. This is, of course, the dream of every medical doctor, but it's not only that. You could see here the number of publications being published every year in this field. And you can see this trend, this exponential growth. So this is really coming. It is also probably a way to better develop drugs, because as you may know, some drug that you give may work on some patient, but not on the others. And the end of the clinical result is negative, although it could be positive 
for sub small subsets of patients. So this aspect is going to be very important. Let me give you just two very simple examples. That's what we call drugs with companion personalized genetic test. So the kind of sequencing that you're going to do will hopefully be useful to personalize or at least to target the drugs you're going to take for a certain disease. This is just when I was in medical school. This is just an example of lung cancer. We had three, and we'll not go, of course, into detail, adenocarcinoma, squamous, or large cell. They were defined only by the morphology. That's what, how we were raised in medical school. Today, you can see that more than half of the lung cancer are related to gene defect, and that some of the drugs can be targeted to some of those gene defect. And let me give you one example. This is a, a, a drug developed by Roche, a very nice Swiss company, uh, that has developed an interesting therapy for metastatic melanoma. Those, as you know, are very difficult disease. Specifically, if they start to spread, now the, the, the death rate is very high. Now, if you have, an, again, I will not go into detail, but if you have a mutation in a certain gene, this BRAVV600, this drug will save your life. Now, this is a small subset of melanoma, but the idea is that we will go with time matching your genome and specifically not the one you were necessarily born with, but you will have, because of all the mutation that we, in fact, carry with time, we will have to redo your genome probably every so often, like you go for an X-ray or for a CAT scan. Now, you imagine the three billion just codes that you have to memorize for each genome. So one of the major challenges is how are we going to store this data? Can we afford just the technology to store? This is something that is absolutely fascinating in the world of computer science. The fourth medicine is called preventive medicine. And this focuses on the quality of aging through appropriate lifestyle. And I'm a strong believer, maybe this is because I get to a certain age, that this is a very important part of medicine. And I think physical, mental exercise is now recognized to be more important than we ever thought. Social behavior, disease prevention by drugs, nutrition. And I think for a state, that will be probably the most important thing in terms of cost benefit. It is expensive to go to cardiac surgery. If you could prevent it, of course, that would be better. Now, this is the beginning, but you could start to see through the horizon this personalization, as I said, because of the omics being genomics, metabolomics. So you will hopefully identify predisposing genes and risk factors, and of course, tailored prevention program according to the knowledge that you have of your own genome and metabolome, for example, uh, uh, background. And hopefully modify those by lifestyle, nutrition, drugs, now, you can say, does this exist? Yes, it exists for certain disease, and I'll come back to that. But I think one of the things that we will, as a, a society, specifically in the developing world, have to uh, uh, tackle is the increase of life expectancy. This is, of course, the result of modern medicine, of hygiene. But what you could see, this is quite amazing, the development. Known in the developed countries, but you see in developing countries, China, for example, with a one-child policy, is facing a major problem in the decades to come. Now, how did we come to that? Now, you just to, to see that 2 billion humans will be over 60 years in 2050. This is something very new for humanity. Now, the results of a lot of things, certainly hygiene and so on, but also what we'd call the bionic man. The engineers have nearly produce replacement for every piece that we have. Now, you look at the heart, every piece of the heart can be replaced. Osteoarticular, hearing aids, sphincters, you name it. The problem is spare parts for everything except the brain. So we're going to get older and older. And in fact, somebody, a girl that is born in Switzerland today has a life expectancy of 100 years. Now, you imagine the impact on society. We'll have to add a fourth generation to our concept. All the family was based on three generations. We knew our grandfathers, but what is the relation that mankind will have with its great-grandchildren and its great-great-grandchildren? 
how are we going to maintain sociology, uh, socially those people? I think this is just going to improve even more. I will not go again into the, uh, into the detail, but I've been part of what you call tissue engineering. Today, by various technology like bioprinting, you can start to do actual track here. Tomorrow, maybe, you will be to have your own heart produced in vitro using iPS cells or autologous cells. This is not unthinkable. So the spare parts are about to come. And with minimally invasive surgery, those can be affordable to a lot of people. Now, of course, this is nice if you want to repair, but let's concentrate as a society on prevention. And that we have already anti-hypertensive, anti-hyperlipidemics agents are in fact already preventing drugs. Food suple supplements, vitamins, stenols, omega-3, antioxidant, polyphenols, you name it. And last and most important thing, I think, lifestyle, physical, mental, mental exercise, nutrition are going to be very important. Let me just give you one example of science. We've learned now that caloric restriction can increase life expectancy. It started in this little yeast, then it was shown in C. elegans, that's a little worm used by biologists. Then you go up the, the, the chain and you use Drosophila, the, the, the vinegar ma, uh, ma, um, fly, zebrafish, and even in mice. If you restrict calorie restriction, you can increase, depending on the species, from 30 to 50 percent the life expectancy. This was recently tested in primates. So they've took primates restriction 30 percent over 20 years. But let me tell you, it's probably not the funnest way to live. This is very harsh caloric restriction. But when you do this, and that's probably taking one joy of life out of our life, which certainly, and it shows, I wouldn't be ready to obey by. And I think we can't, you know, but what has been shown in the primates, it's slowed down the aging process. The instance of diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular, but also, most important thing, you know, cerebral atrophy. Now, you see, those are two monkeys. They were, this one was calorie restricted for 20 years. This one was not. <laughs> so it shows that there is maybe something to be done. But again, we were more interested by the idea that can we find something that would mimic caloric restriction? So I have good and bad news for you. I'll come back to it. But we start to understand what we call the metabolic pathway related to aging. And if there's something absolutely fascinating in modern biology, probably the most interesting today is the biology of aging. We start to understand some of the molecular pathway and one of them, of course, I will not go into the detail of all this, but is related to what people have looked at, which I thought was a bad and a, and a good news, is red wine. So let me be very clear about it. There is a molecule in the, in the skin of red grapes called resveratrol. That was probably the first time that some people made the link between nutrition and health for disease prevention and aging. Now, let me also be very clear. It's in red wine, but it's not in sufficiently high quality, or can't quantity, sorry. To get what you need, you would probably need to drink about 10 liters of red wine, so I do not you know, suggest that you proceed that way. <laughs> but let me tell you that this was quite remarkable. This was published recently first in mice. You could see mice under high calorie, and you could see that the life expectancy, so you can even have a high calorie diet and live as long as if you don't have, if you take this resveratrol. So I think this is interesting, but again, what is most interesting is this resveratrol seems to be impacted on this metabolic pathway related to aging. So what we're starting to see is a new science in this area, and my lab has looked at it. In one of them, we've identified uh, several molecules in what we call superfruits. We know, for example, that pomegranate, and I was seeing in Jerusalem, yesterday that you know, people uh, taking pomegranate juice. Pomegranate juice seem to have very interesting molecules. So we've been able to identify in pomegranate some molecules that act on some of those gene pathways. And if you give it to the C. elegans, you increase the life expectancy of those things by 50%. Recently, 
We're just now doing this in mice and seem to see the same effect in mice. So now, for human, it's going to take a long time to know if you can increase life expectancy. But certainly it's just there to make a, a link between what I call, you know, uh, this nutrition emergence of functional food and the margin of aging. Now, why are we so concerned? Because we know this is the thing that as we age, we are the most concerned. It's Alzheimer's disease and the various other dementia. And the statistics, as you know, are frightening. You can see that if you get to 90 years old, 22% of the male and 30% of the female will be hit by Alzheimer's. And as we're getting, as the we're getting older and older, we start to think that this is something that we may be suffering from. So I think there is an urgency, a medical urgency, to do something about it. And as you know, just uh, uh, fundamentally, just to explain to you how the, works, it, the brain works, when we're born, we start to divide the cell, we start to lose some of the cells, the neuro, the nerve cells, before we're born, and we continue losing them during life. And now the problem is some people lose them faster, and you get to a certain point, usually 80% in a, in a specific system, where you start to see the symptoms. Same thing for Parkinson's disease, but probably also for Alzheimer's. So the idea is, can we shift this uh, slope by 5, 10, or 20 years? And probably we will have gained a lot as a society. So what should we do about dementia? Pharma are developing what we call small molecules. Vaccination is something interesting. But I think a lot will happen in this area. Functional food, healthy nutrition. We know, for example, that Mediterranean diet is protecting aging to a certain extent. So we need to develop the science because this was not considered as a really interesting science. It was considered as soft science. So I think what we need to do is to put them back together. Just one example, if you ask mice, if you put them in a normal cage without any of those toys, they age faster and they lose memory. If you give them something to do with those toys, you could see that they have better memory. But why is that so? Because we're able to, in fact, divide some of our cells in our brain in a little organ called the hippocampus, which is related to memory. So we start to know that we can probably, by behaving, increasing and reproducing nerve cells in our brain. So this is all, we're just there at the beginning, but again, to coming back to some of our superfruits, we've identified molecules that seem to prevent mice that suffer from Alzheimer's models disease from dementia, from the lack of capacity, from the memory ability. So it seems that there is an opening. It will take time, but I think we need to get there. And I'll finish with those uh, three slides to tell you why. And there, I'm changing a little bit my hat, and I'm putting my real neuroscientist. I'm a neuroscientist and passion. And we've started about 10 years ago to hire somebody called Henry Markram. He was a professor at the Weizmann Institute. He was on his way to MIT. And I've convinced the gentleman not to go to MIT, but to stop in Lausanne, and to try to develop something new to tackle what we call the mind issue. Can we start to understand, with all the tools that we have today in neuroscience, can we start to have just some techniques that allows us to approach the issue of the mind? And he was brave enough and ambitious enough to do it. So he decided not to go to MIT. He was about one week from signing and stop in Lausanne. And now he has launched this wonderful program called the Human Brain Project. First, we called it the Blue Brain Project because he was trying, the ambition is to try, is to build a simulation system, a research facility capable of constructing unifying software models of the brain. Now, you don't have to read all this, but you can say this is a very expensive supercomputer that cost me a fortune. It's about 10 millions that I have to find every three years to just maintain the thing. So this is a very challenging because the computers are going at such a speed. But now we have, and his ambition was to try to simulate what we call a cortical columns. A cortical columns is a base unit that we have in our brain. There's about in human about 100,000 neurons built in it. And now you need, just to give you an example, a petaflop machine 
10 to the 15th operating per second, operation per second, to simulate one of those. Now we have about a million of those in our brain. And the idea is to find a computer that could simulate. The problem, the problem is this computer does not exist yet. We would need what we call a hexaflop machine, a 10 to the 18th fl uh, flop per second. And we have, were, uh, in fact, uh, very happy recently. We were awarded one of the two what we call Fed flagship projects. Those are the big uh, uh, project that Europe has launched at the level of 1 billion euro per project. So we received one of those, one of the two. I was, as you can imagine, very pleased. Now, this is over 10 years, so it's an only, if you could say, 100 million a year. But still, this is a very big. Now, President Obama announced in his State of the Union address about three weeks after the award that the Americans will launch a brain mapping project that they will put to a level of 3 billion. And I had the visit of the Chinese Academy of Science last week, and they're going to announce also a 1 billion project, brain project. So you can see that the world is putting now its effort to try to understand our biggest machine, the brain. So let me give you just one example of how you enter this circuit. This is one cortical column. You can enter it, and you see the complexity of the networks. And this is at one-tenth of, of the reality. This is our brain. This is the complexity. But we start now by what we could do, reverse engineering, the tools maybe, to try to simulate how our brains, brains, work, our brains work. We will continue, need to continue to have people gathering all this data because we'll need the building blocks. So we need the experimental neuroscientists. But this data will be, to some extent, simulated, collected, and simulated like the CERN did for the particle physicist. And the idea is that you can come up, this is a functional cortical column where you get the simulation of its electrical activity. So this is just a beginning of what we're trying to do. But I think in the 21st century, for the first time, mankind will have a tool to try to understand how our, works, our brain works. But most importantly, and hopefully, through this understanding, we'll be able to design new therapies. Because as I told you, with the aging population, the biggest challenge today to find something against dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So in conclusion, how should we go about? What is successful aging? I think it's a mixture of social life engagement, of disease prevention, and of intellectual and physical activities. Those are extremely important. You will see probably new healthcare company, including diagnostic, nutrition, life science, drugs, and most of all, what I thought I tried to illustrate today, access to the big data. This work is coming because of this info nano biocogno convergence, and I think this is the future. And I'm looking forward to continue this fascinating journey with as many scientists as we can and hopefully as many scientists from the Ben-Gurion University. And I'm really looking in the years to come to collaborate, fruitful collaboration between EPFL and Ben-Gurion University. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lassure. I have to, uh, before we conclude, I, I have a personal note, because I, I learned from you that a personal note is uh, something you have to say. I, I was uh, admitted, I came to Bengal University 30 years ago, uh, hard to believe, as a medical student. And uh, the medical school was very unique that time. And uh, I was the, the first uh, Two people that really influenced me were uh, Professor Privas and Professor Antonovsky at the time that were uh, putting up this very special school. And the specialty about that, that they said that there is personalized medicine. They didn't use this term. Nobody thought about gene sequencing. And Professor Glick, uh, who is here, and, and Rivka probably all remember that those days that we were already 
And I think in this sense, Ben Gurion University was also a pioneer in that sense that we have to treat the person medicine. 30 years past, I, I talked yesterday with a good friend and a colleague of us who is the chair of biomedical engineering. And we were discussing personal medicine because he is now trying to recover from aggressive chemotherapy and he allowed me to say it from bone cancer. And we kind of discussed how far we are still uh, from really personal medicine. But with your uh, lecture, I think we are all kind of hoping that that will come one day. So thank you very much again. And I would like to conclude uh, the annual Zlotowski event uh, by thanking everyone and for being us today and by expressing my gratitude for uh, the lecture and the thought that uh, you brought uh, with you. Uh, I would like to remind all uh, that um, there is upcoming lunch that is held to be at the students uh, and the women's discussion uh, that is scheduled for 2 p.m. And uh, I think uh, there is also a lecture by Meir Shalev but you're all uh, invited. And lastly, of course, the honorary doctor conference ceremony that would be uh, tonight at 7.30 p.m. And thank you very much for being here.